Hey guys, what is up? I hope you're doing well and staying safe. Trust me, this is just as weird for you as it is for me. I haven't had to film one of these videos since earlier this year in quarantine and I am so happy we are not back in quarantine. I have some important information for you guys tonight before we start. First things first, make sure you follow us on all of our social medias to stay updated with things like this. Follow us on Instagram at Red Out Grace. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on YouTube. Like and subscribe. And definitely, definitely, definitely follow us on TikTok at Grace U underscore. Speaking of which, some social media stuff you need to know. You can register to be a part of our social media team. All you gotta do is go to our link tree in our Instagram bio to register, or you can go to egracechurch.com slash ccu. Make sure you guys check that out, fill that information out, and you guys can be a part of our social media team. I will see you guys after TV gets done talking to sign us out and to give these guys some more information. Bye. So when you hear the word family, What's the first thing that you think of? What, what other words come in your head or what picture maybe pops into your mind? Uh, for me, when I hear the word family, I think of a couple things. First, I obviously think of my current family. I'm um, the one that, that you all know and the one that you all love so well. Um, of, of me and Elisa and Gemma. Um, and, and this is like a busy time of our life right now. Um, having a, a year and a half old little girl who is running everywhere and, and talking a ton and, and just life is crazy right now for us. Um, we're in definitely that like messy stage where everything in our house is like sticky or grimy and, and not because of me or Elisa, because of, well, we have a one and a half year old that's running around touching everything as she licks her hand and touches it. It's gross. But, but I think of that family and I also think of my, my family growing up, meaning like my parents. Um, and see, growing up, I, I'm an only child. So it was just me, mom, and dad. Now for some of you listening, you might be like, that sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Right, like, and if you're an only child, you know, kudos to you. We need to, we need to talk about our, our only child experiences. But those of you who have siblings, you might think of being an only child is like a pretty sweet deal, right? It's just you, mom and dad, undivided attention. You can get whatever you want. But to be quite honest, you and when growing up, I, I really wanted a sibling. I, a lot of the time, it was boring with just me, my mom, and my dad. And I had a good group of friends. I hang out with them. But but there was something just exciting about life with a sibling that I always I always wanted. Those of you with siblings right now are probably like, you are crazy. You just need to love being an only child and move on. But, but I digress. Uh, those are the two visions that I have in my head when I think of family. And, and here's, the, here's the deal. Whatever you think of, whatever words pop into your head, whatever picture of family looks like for you, it pops into your head. Uh, we have some different definitions of what family looks like. Some of us have more traditional families. Um, maybe like me growing up where it was mom and dad and me and that was it. Maybe throw a couple siblings in there and a more traditional family. Some of us, we have non-traditional families. I mean, we've got a bunch of people in the house. We've got maybe grandparents with us or maybe, maybe you have different guardians or whatever the case may be. And maybe your family is a little what they would consider traditional. Personally, I don't believe any family is traditional. I believe we all have our quirks and there's no traditional family, but, but whatever. And so regardless of whatever your definition of family is, if it's more traditional or non-traditional, here's something that's true for all of us. That every family is unique and complicated. Let me explain. See, every family is unique. Uh, when it comes to the people in it, when it comes to the traditions, when it comes to the celebrations, or when it comes to, to whatever the things are that you do as a family that make your family unique, uh, no one family is like the other. Each and every family is unique and different and stands out in different ways. But that also means that every family is not perfect. It means that every family also is complicated. It means that because none of us are perfect, because all of us have our stuff that we bring to our households, to our families, it means that our families can sometimes get a little complicated. It means that we go through some struggles. Sometimes life is tough for our family. Things aren't always uh, up and to the right. Sometimes things aren't so great for our families as well.
And some of us, see, we might have grown up, and as a kid specifically, so more preschool, elementary age, you might have grown up thinking that your parents were superheroes and that your family was absolutely perfect in every possible way. And then maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was late elementary school for you, or maybe it was middle school, or maybe even high school. Um, something shifts, something happens. And it's not that your parents do something terrible all the time, but, but a lot of the time what happens is we just begin to understand that our families might not be perfect. Our parents might not be superheroes. Uh, things might not be as we thought they were before. And this reality sets in that our families aren't perfect, that our families are actually complicated, and the relationships in them are messy. And no matter when you discovered this, whether it was elementary school or middle school or high school, I know for me, it, it was late elementary school and middle school that I discovered that my family wasn't always perfect, but that in fact my family uh, was a little fractured. And see, in each of our households, um, we, we can discover some different ways that, that there's some brokenness, that there's some things in our family that make our family fractured. And see, the first thing I think that sometimes we, we begin to realize is present in our family home is, is we begin to realize that there's this constant tension maybe in our families. Uh, that when it comes to maybe maybe job transition or maybe a, a strained relationship or maybe a mistake that, that, that someone had to get punished for, whatever it might be, uh, or maybe when it comes to finances, whatever the case may be, we begin to feel that there's this constant tension in our family uh, that sort of that just hovers over. There's a pressure. There's an unspoken spoken um, bitterness or anger or something that's present in our family, in our homes. It may be constant tension for you. Maybe it looks like this big unsaid thing that just somebody needs to say and address in your family. But whatever it is, chances are that, that your family has lived or is currently living with a constant tension um, with, within the four walls of your house. Also, another thing that, that could be present are secrets. And hear me, every family has secrets. So we said every family is, is unique and complicated. Every family has secrets. Uh, whether it's a secret that maybe has been kept from you, things that you don't know about, a parent or a sibling. Uh, whether it's a secret that you have, that you haven't shared with someone else in your family. Every single family has secrets. And these secrets can sometimes strain relationships and fracture families at the core. Here, here's the other deal. Sometimes our families, we experience not necessarily constant tension or secrets, we just experience fractures. There's great pain and, and, and tough situations and crisis that happens in our family where it's no longer rose-colored glasses and we begin to see things for how they really are and, and it's broken and messy and sometimes really, really tough to overcome. But here's the deal. Just like every family is unique and every family is complicated, every family is fractured, including mine, including yours. Every family is fractured, and that's because every person and every family is imperfect. Yes, your parents, they aren't perfect. Your siblings, they aren't perfect. Your grandparents, your aunts, uncles, whoever, they aren't perfect. But, but also keep in mind that, that you're not perfect either. And chances are we have this, what, an ideal family in our head looks like. And we might wish, like, man, I wish that my family was, was this ideal. I wish that my family got along all the time, that we went on family vacations, that we didn't argue, and that, and that life was just peaceful in our house, or whatever the case may be. But there's a difference between having an ideal family, what we, what we hope to be an ideal family, and what our real family actually is. And maybe you're sitting here wondering, like, well, I know my real family is way off from my ideal family, and what am I going to do about it? Am I ever going to have a peaceful home? Am I ever going to be out of this situation? And I just want to spend a few moments um, through video today and just encourage you by looking at what God does in the midst of fractured families. And you might not know this, but the Bible is actually full of families that were fractured. The Bible has a ton of experience, a ton of stories, a ton of insight into how fractured families operate. Uh, the Bible is full of them. And it also gives, what we're going to talk about in a second, some hope for fractured families. And we're going to talk about something today that maybe changes the way you view you and your family and you view your family as a whole. And, and my prayer, my hope today is that this will change the way you view your family potentially for the rest of your life. And that this good change can happen when it comes to you and your family and your household. And so we're going to look at one family in particular. And, and 
where we're going to start on this family tree is with a guy named Abraham. Uh, see, Abraham, he was promised by God to have this big family, and, and they, they would be this great nation. And from that family line would actually come Jesus. That means that Jesus, if you went all the way back up the family tree, would be traced back to this guy named Abraham. And so before we can obviously get to Jesus, before any of these things can happen, we have to, you know, Abraham has to have a kid first. So Abraham, he has a son named Isaac. And then Isaac has two boys named Esau and Jacob. And that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about these two brothers, Esau and Jacob today. And, and maybe if, if you've got a brother, if you've got even another sibling, you, you know how this works, right? Um, even though you're in the same household, even though you have the same family, sometimes siblings can be totally different from one another, right? And Esau and Jacob were totally different from one another. See, Esau was, was more of this outdoorsman, this hunter, this, this tough and rugged guy. He was the older sibling. And Jacob, uh, Jacob was more, the younger sibling, and Jacob was more artistic. He was a poet. He was a thinker, more philosophical, if you will. But with that also came some deceit, um, some, some cunningness, if you will, to Jacob. And Jacob, as we're going to see, actually uses that to his disadvantage and, and does some things that actually um, tend to put a strain on this family. So, so Esau and Jacob growing up, um, they had this sibling rivalry. And there was one day, the, story tells, uh, the Bible tells a story where Esau comes home from hunting. He, he was outdoors, he was hunting, and he comes home and he's hungry. And we're not talking like the kind, like, oh, I'm kind of hungry, let me get a snack. We're talking like the hungry where you are just starving, where you could down like 15 slices of pizza, not stop, right? So Esau is hungry. So he sits down and he, and he wants to have this meal, but then Jacob, or he asks, he asks for a soup, he asks for something to eat, he asks for this cup of stew or cup of soup. And Jacob actually tries to use this opportunity to like negotiate Esau for something. See, being the firstborn, be, being the firstborn in a family back in those times uh, meant that you had this special birthright. And this birthright came with a lot of perks. It meant that you would be the head of your family. Basically, you'd inherit all the stuff that your parents had once, once your dad died. So once Isaac died, then Esau was in line to inherit all this stuff. And, and one of the coolest perks, too, of, of having the birthright, of being the firstborn, was that you got this special blessing from God that your father that the father would give to the firstborn and that you would get this special blessing which means that you'd like be be almost extra blessed by God. And so Jacob in his cunningness and his sort of crafty and sneaky way didn't really love the fact that Esau was in line for this birthright. And so Jacob thought, well what an opportunity. Maybe I can maybe I can maneuver my way and sneak my way into getting this birthright that Esau has. So check out this exchange. Check out what happens. It says, The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. So this is, this is a story of classic sibling rivalry. And did you even see in the beginning of the verses, I hope you caught this, that, that there was even some like parental favoritism there. Did you notice that, that Isaac and Rebekah, they weren't even in agreement. They had some, some tension too of who they loved more, who was their favorite child. And, and, so, and so, you know, Esau's famished, he's just hungry. And so Jacob uses this opportunity to basically try to con Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of stew. And sure enough, sadly, it, it works. And so Esau ends up giving up his birthright to Jacob. And we actually fast forward in the story, we actually see that, that Jacob actually gets this birthright. And he actually does it by impersonating Esau. And on his father, when his father was almost dead, um, Jacob went in, he impersonated Esau. He dressed like him. He, put, he, he, like, he like made himself look like Esau. And so Isaac couldn't tell which son was there. And he actually lied to his father and told him that it was Esau standing there and that he, that he wanted his blessing now. 
He wanted that blessing from his father right then. So Isaac, none the wiser, gives Jacob this blessing that's meant for Esau. And you can tell, you can imagine how this goes. So Jacob, he, he leaves and, and Esau comes in. And, and Esau's talking to Isaac and, and then Esau discovers what Jacob has done. And so check out Esau's reaction to Jacob. This comes from Genesis 27. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then... I will kill my brother, Jacob. <laughs> wow. Talk about a family crisis here, right? This makes, this makes your tough family conversations that you have at the dinner table look like nothing. So Esau is so upset about Jacob stealing his birthright and stealing his blessing from his father that he says, yeah, my dad might be about to die. And then I'm going to mourn him. And then after that, I'm going to kill my brother. I mean, this is like a made-for-TV movie, right? Like, like this is like this would be a great Netflix series. It's, it's it's this crazy drama in this family. But here's the amazing part: for as broken, for as messed up, for as fractured as this family was, God still did something incredible. See, when we fast forward all the way, this is this this you know the stories in the Old Testament. In fact, the first book of the Old Testament of the Bible. It's like the very beginning of, of the recorded story of God and God's people. And so, when we fast forward to the New Testament, one of the later books in the New Testament, the Book of Hebrews. Uh, the Book of Hebrews it talks about this lineage of people that ended up displaying this huge faith, and eventually, like this line ends with Jesus. And lo and behold, the names of Jacob and Esau are found in this text in Hebrews. Not talking about their amazing family, but talking about how great their faith is. Check this out. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Here's what's amazing about this. The writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews didn't spend time saying that this was a family to model your own family after. The author of Hebrews didn't spend time saying that Jacob and Esau were blameless and perfect people. Uh, the writer of Hebrews didn't spend time going like, this is the perfect way to live out your family's life. No, no, it wasn't anything like that. What the author of Hebrews was highlighting was God's work in a fractured family. And the author of Hebrews was highlighting nothing the family did. But, all, but the fact that God worked in spite of the family's dysfunction, in spite of the family's mistakes. And this should give us some hope tonight. This should give you and me some hope tonight. Because from God's perspective, there's no family that you can ever count out. From God's perspective, no family story is finished because He's still at work, even when we can't see it. That no person in our family, no person in your family, is beyond the reach of God to redeem and do something incredible through. See, it's not God's plan for us to have these fractured, broken, imperfect families. God's desire for us would be to have families that thrive and that, and that love and have Him at the center and, and, and are thriving. But, but here's the beautiful part. Even though that's God's desire for us, God doesn't leave us there when our families are fractured. See, God's in the work of he, God's in the redemption business. That means that He is able to redeem our families, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, even when there's tension and secrets and fractures. God is still at work. If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this: that your family matters, even though it's fractured. That your family matters, even when it's fractured. That your family, because, because God sees your family and knows your family and loves your family, there's still hope for them. There's still hope for every person in your family because God's work is not done. God can still do incredible things. God can still redeem the brokenness in your family. So here's a couple things I want to leave you with, a couple reminders and things I want to encourage you with. The first thing, is don't count them out. Don't count your family out. If your stepdad doesn't show up and you might be ready to throw in the towel, don't count them out. When your mom loses her temper and goes off on you, don't count her out. 
when you think you're ready to give up on your sibling and ignore them for, you know, for who knows how long because of mistakes they keep making. Don't count them out. Don't count them out. Not because of anything that they do or anything about them, but because of who God is. Now hear me, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying to stick around in a dangerous situation. I'm not saying to stick around and put yourself in danger if, if there's a big situation like that in your family. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we don't have to permanently give up on someone and lose all hope for them because God is still at work. Don't count them out. But in addition to not counting them out, here's the other piece. Don't count yourself out. When, when your parents are fighting and you're just ready to remove yourself from the family, don't count yourself out. When there's tension and when, when there's a secret that comes up maybe and you're ready to just say, I'm done with this, I'm over this relationship, I'm done with this parent or I'm done with this sibling or I'm done with this family member, I'm ready, I'm ready to exit. Don't count yourself out. Once again, it doesn't mean putting yourself in harm's way, but maybe it does mean enduring some of those more annoying moments. Maybe instead of slamming your door when your mom wants to just talk to you, maybe it means that it's probably best to sit there and listen to what they have to say. And maybe when, when asked for a response, when asked to solve a conflict between you and a sibling, instead of just blowing up or using whatever defense mechanism you already have planned, maybe it means actually leaning into the conversation and being genuine and figuring out how you can, following God, redeem the work, redeem what he wants to do in your family in that relationship. So don't count them out and, and don't count yourself out. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't put yourself in danger. But maybe it means enduring some of those annoying moments. Maybe it means having the conversation when you'd rather not have the conversation. Maybe it means being mature instead of taking that opportunity to be petty. Maybe it means being uncomfortable when the easy thing to do is just sit in your room and, and be comfortable with the door closed. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I know that, that God sees and knows and loves you and your family. And I know that none of us are perfect. No one, no one person in the family is perfect, which means that no family is perfect. And there might be things that have happened to you that, that you feel like are, are huge areas of pain and huge things that are going to be impossible to overcome. Maybe you feel like there's tension that's too big to overcome. Maybe you feel like that there's secrets that, that, that are too big for you to move past. Maybe you feel like there's fractures that are too deep for you to ever heal from. But I just wanna encourage you to not count your family out. Don't count yourself out, not because of anything you can do, but because of who God is. What if, you went, what if you lived today? What if you went through today believing that peace was possible in your family? What if you began to believe that love was possible in your family? where love had been absent so long? What if you get, began to believe that healing was possible in your family? What if you began to believe that unity was possible in your family? Not because of anything you or I or your parents can do, but because of who God is. He redeemed my family as a middle schooler, as a punk middle schooler and an angry high schooler. God redeemed and restored my family. And I know he can do the same for yours. Because your family matters, even when it's fractured. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you see and you know and you love our families. I thank you that you see and you know and you love us. And God, for whatever fracture is on our minds right now when it comes to our families, for whatever relationship is strained, for whatever secret is present, whatever, whatever tension is, is there, God, we ask that, that instead of looking at the problem and thinking it's impossible, God, that we would look to you and understand that things that seem impossible are possible through you. God, we lift up whatever fractures and brokenness and things are present in our family. God, we lift them up to you. And God, we ask that you would do what we think is impossible. God, we submit ourselves to you and ask for you to continue to work in and through us so that our fractured families can be restored. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching.
Thank you so much, TP. Last but not least, we have some really, really important and exciting stuff coming at you guys really, really soon. Grace Church's worship pastor, Casey, has just released an Advent devotional just in time for Christmas. What, what? We will be doing a four week study on Casey's book online Tuesdays at 8 p.m. And we don't really have a lot of information on how you guys can sign up just yet, but make sure you mark your calendars. And when we have information, we will definitely be sending it out. So mark your calendars now so you can join us online later. We will see you guys next week. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight as much as I did. And I'm so excited to see you guys in person again next week. Not that I don't love online, but I definitely miss you. I will see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>